All Creatures Great and Small, Chapter 9. First, please, I called as I looked into first, please, I called as I looked into the waiting room. There was an old lady with a cat in a cardboard box, two small boys trying to keep hold of a rabbit, and somebody I didn't recognize at first. And then I remembered it was Soames. When it was his turn, he came into the surgery, but he was a vastly different character from the one I knew. He wore an ingratiating smile, his head bobbed up and down as he spoke. He radiated anxiety to please. And the most interesting thing was that his right eye was puffed and closed and surrounded by an extensive area of bluish black flesh. I hope you don't mind my coming to see you, Mr. Harriet, he said. The fact is, I have resigned my position with his lordship and I'm looking for another post. I was wondering if you and Mr. Farnan would put a word in for me if you've heard anything. I was too astonished at the transformation to say much. I replied that we would do what we could and Soames thanked me effusively and he bowed himself out. I turned to Siegfried after, what, after he had gone. <laughs> what do you make of that? Oh, I know all about it. Siegfried looked at me with a wry smile. Remember I told you he was working one or two shady sidelines up there, selling a few bags of corn or a hundred weight of fertilizer here and there? It all mounted up, but it didn't last. He got a bit careless, and he was out on his ear before he ever knew what happened. Well, how about that lovely black eye? Oh, he got that from Tommy. You must have seen Tommy when you were there. He's the horseman. My mind went back to that uncomfortable night and to the quiet man holding the horse's head. I remember him. Big fat chap. Yes, he's a big lad, and I'd hate to have him punch me in the eye. Soames gave him a hell of a life, and as soon as Tommy heard about the sacking, he paid a visit just to settle the score. I was now comfortably settled in the way of life in Skeldale House. At first, I wondered where Tristan fitted into that setup. Was he supposed to be seeing practice, having a holiday, working, or what? But it soon became clear that he was a factotum who dispensed and delivered medicines, washed cars, answered his phone, and even in an emergency, went to a case. At least that was how Siegfried saw him, and he had a repertoire of tricks aimed at keeping him on his toes like returning unexpectedly or bursting into a room in the hope of catching him doing nothing. He never seemed to notice the obvious fact that the college vacation was over and Tristan should have been back there. I came to the conclusion over the next month that Tristan must have had some flexible arrangement with the college authorities because, for a student, he seemed to spend an apprising, a surprising amount of time at home. He interpreted his role rather differently from his brother, and while residence in Darby, he devoted a considerable amount of his acute intelligence to the cause of doing little as possible. Tristan did, in fact, spend much of his time sleeping in a chair. When he was left behind to dispense and when we went out on our rounds, he followed an unvarying procedure. He filled half a 16-ounce bottle with water and added a few drams of chlorodyne and a little epica... Ep epicacawana. Pushed the cork in and took it through the sitting room to stand by his favorite chair. It was a wonderful chair for his purpose old-fashioned, high back with wings to support his head. He would get out a da his daily mirror, light a woodbine, and settle down until sleep overcame him. If Siegfried rushed in on him, he grabbed the bottle and started to shake it madly, inspecting the contents at intervals. And then he went through to the dispensary, filled up the bottle, and labeled it. It was a sound, workable system, but it had one big snag. He never knew whether it was Siegfried or not when the door opened. 
and I often walked in and found him half lying in his chair, staring up with his startled, sleep-blurred eyes while he agitated his bottle. Most evenings found him sitting on a high stool at the bar, at a, at the bar counter of the drover's arms conversing effortlessly with the barmaid. At other times, he would be out with one of the young nurses from the local hospital, which he seemed to regard as an agency to provide him with female company. All in all, he managed to lead a fairly full life. Saturday night, 10.30 p.m., I was writing up my visits when the phone rang. I swore, crossed my fingers, and lifted the receiver. Hello, Harriet speaking. Oh, it's you, is it? growled a dour voice in, broad, in the broadest Yorkshire. Well, I want Mr. Farnan. I'm sorry, Mr. Farnan is out. Can I help you? Well, I hope so, but I'd far rather have your boss. This is Sim of Beale Close. Oh, no, please, no, God, no, not Beale Close on a Saturday night, miles up a hill at the end of a rough lane with about eight gates. Yes, Mr. Sims, what is the trouble? I'll tell you, there's some trouble and all. I have a grand big show horse here, all seventeen hands. He cut himself badly on one hind leg, just above the hock. I want him stitched immediately. Glory be above the hock, what a charming place to have to stitch a horse. Unless he's very quiet, this is going to be a real panic. How big is the wound, Mr. Sims? Big? It's a girt big thing, about a foot long and bleeding like hell, and this horse is as weak as an eel. Could kick a fly's eye out. I can't get near him no how. Goes straight up the wall when anybody when he sees anybody. By God, I tell you, I had him to the blacksmith the other day, and the feller was dead scared of him. Twilton curse, he was girt oss he is damn you sims damn build clothes and damn your twiltin girt oss well i'll be along straight away try to have some men handy just in case we have to throw him throw him throw him <laughs> you'd never throw this horse he'd kill you first anyway i have no men here so you'll have to manage on your own I know Mr. Farnan wouldn't have want a lot of men to help him. Lovely, lovely, lovely. This is going to be one for the diary. Very well, I'm leaving now, Mr. Sims. Oh, and I nearly forgot. My road got washed away in the floods yesterday. You'll have to walk the last mile and a half. So get a move on, and don't keep me waiting up all night. This is just a bit too much. Look here, Mr. Sims. I do not like your tone. I said I would leave now, and I will get there as soon as I can. Oh, you don't like me tone, huh? Well, I don't like useless young apprentices practicing on my good stock, so I don't want no cheek from you. You you know now about the damn job any road that finally does it. Now, you just listen to me, Mr. Sims. If it wasn't for the sake of the horse, I would refuse to come at all. Who do you think you are, anyway? If you ever try to speak to me like that again... Now, now, Jim, get a grip on yourself. Take it easy, old boy. You'll burst, burst a blood vessel if you keep going on like that. Who the devil? Now, now, Jim, you just calm yourself. Calm that temper of yours. You know you really have to watch it. Tristan, where in the hell are you speaking from? The kiosk outside the drovers, five pints inside me and feeling a bit puckish. Thought I'd give you a ring. By God, I'll murder you one of these days if you don't stop this game. It's putting years on me. Now, again, now and again, it isn't so bad, but this is the third time this week. Ah, but it was by far the best, Jim. It was really wonderful. When you started drawing yourself up to your full height, it nearly killed me. Oh, God, I wish I could have heard yourself. He trailed it off into helpless laughter. And then my feeble attempts at retaliation, creeping, trembling in some lonely phone box. 
Is that young Mr. Farnan? In a guttural groak. Well, this is Tillson at High Road. I want you to come out here imme immediately. I have a terrible case of... Excuse me for interrupting, Jim, but is there something the matter with your tonsils? Oh, good. Well, then, go on with what you were saying, old lad. Sounds very interesting. There was only one time when I was not on the receiving end. It was Tuesday, my half day. 11.30 a.m., a call came in. An eversion of a uterus in a cow. This is a tough job in the country practice, and I felt the usual chill. It happens when the cow, after calving, continues to strain until it pushes out the entire uterus and it hangs down as far as the animal's hocks. It is a vast organ and desperately difficult to replace, mainly because the cow, having once got rid of it, does not want it back. And, in a straightforward contest between man and beast, the odds were very much on the cow. Old practitioners, in an effort to even things up a bit, used to sling the cow up by its hind limbs, and the more inventive among them came up with all sorts of contraptions, like the uterine vallus, which was supposed to squeeze the organ into a smaller bulk. But the result was usually the same, hours of back-breaking work. The introduction of the epidural anesthetic made everything easier by removing sensation from the uterus and preventing the cow from straining. But for all that the words calf bed out coming over the line were guaranteed to wipe the smile off of any bet space. I decided to take Tristan in a case I feel I needed a, I needed a few pounds of extra push. He came along, but showed little enthusiasm for the idea. He showed still less when he saw the patient, a very fat shorthorn lying quite unconcerned in her stall. Behind her, a bloody mass of uterus, afterbirth monk, and straw spilled over into the channel. She wasn't at all keen to get up. But after we had done a bit of shouting and pushing at her shoulder, she rose to her feet, looking bored. The epidural space was difficult to find among the rolls of fat, and I wasn't sure if I had injected all the antiseptic into the right place. The re I removed the afterbirth, cleaned the uterus, placed it on a clean sheet held by the farmer and his brother. They were frail men, and it was all that they could do to keep the sheet level. I wouldn't be able to count on them to help me much. I nodded to Tristan, we stripped off our shirts, tying clean sacks around our waist, and gathered the uterus in our arms. It was badly engorged and swollen, and it took us just an hour to get it back. There was a long spell at the beginning when we made no progress at all, and the whole idea of pushing the enormous more organ through a small hole seemed ridiculous, like trying to thread a needle with a sausage. Then there were a few minutes when we thought we were doing famously only to find we were feeding the thing down through a tear in the sheet. Siegfried once told me he spent half the morning trying to stuff a uterus up a cow's rectum. What really worried him, he said, was that he nearly succeeded, and at the end, when hope was fading, there was a blissful moment when the whole thing began to slip inside and incredibly disappeared from sight. Somewhere, half halfway through, we both took a breather at the same time and stood panting, our faces almost touching. Tristan's cheeks were prettily patterned with a a spouting artery where a spouting artery had sprayed him. I was able to look deep into his eyes and I read there was a deep distaste for the whole business. Lathering myself in the bucket and feeling the ache in my shoulders and back, I looked over at Tristan. He was pulling his shirt over his head as though it cost him the last of his strength. The cow, chewing contently at the mouthful of hay, had come had come best out of the affair. 
Out in the car, Tristan groaned. I'm sure that sort of thing isn't good for me. I feel as though I've been run over by a steamroller. Hell, what a life this is at times. After lunch, I rose from the table. I'm off to Broughton now, Tris, and I thought I'd better mention that you may not have seen the last of that cow. These bad cases sometimes recur and there's a chance that a little lot may come out again. If it does, it's all yours because Siegfried won't be back for hours and nothing is going to stop me having my half day. For once, Tristan's sense of humor failed him. He became haggard. He seemed to age suddenly. Oh, God, he moaned. Don't even talk about it. I'm all in. Another session like that would kill me. And I'm on my own? It would be the end of me, I tell you. Oh, very well, I said sadistically. Try not to worry. It may never happen. It was then that I saw the phone box about ten miles along Broughton Road that the thought struck me. I slowed down, got out of the car. I wonder, I muttered. I wonder if I could do it just once. Inside the box, inspiration was strong in me. I wrapped my handkerchief around the mouse piece, dialed the practice number, and when I heard Tristan on the line, I shouted at the top of my voice, Are you the young feller that put her cow's calf bed back in this morning? Yes, I'm one of them. Tension sprang into Tristan's voice. Why, is there something wrong? Aye, there's something wrong. She's putting it out again. Out again? Out again, all of it? He was almost screaming. Aye, it's a terrible mess, pouring blood about the twice the size it was this morning. You'll have some job with her. There was a long silence, and I wondered if he'd fainted. Then I heard him again, hoarse but resolute. Very well, I'll come straight away. There was another pause. He spoke again, almost in a complete whisper. Is it out completely? I broke down. There was a wistful quality about the words which defeated me, a hint of wild hope that the farmer may have been exaggerating and that there might be only a tiny piece peeping out. I began to laugh. I would have liked to toy with my victim a little longer, but it was impossible. I laughed louder and took my handkerchief from the mouthpiece so that Tristan could hear me. I listened for a few seconds to the frenzied swearing at the other end, then gently replaced the receiver. It would probably never happen again, but it was sweet, very sweet. End of chapter 9. All creatures, great and small.